Hey everybody, and welcome back to the Jazz Lab Podcast. I'm so excited today to have the great button masher, aka Jake Silverman here, to teach us all about how he actually arranges music and reharmonizes it, as well as how he turns it into incredible 8-bit chiptune music. So if you've ever been interested in composition, arranging, or video game music in general, this episode is very much for you. Jake is actually a Grammy award-winning arranger, which is so cool. Um, I've known him for many years, and just to be able to say that is amazing. And the last thing that you really should know going into this video is that I cut these into shorter versions for YouTube, but if you wanna see the entire podcast, be sure to click the link in the description and choose the streaming platform of your choice to check out the rest. And of course, really quick, if you're new to the channel, consider clicking subscribe so you don't miss any more videos just like this one. And please hit that like button if you already know that you like my content because I work really hard on bringing as much valuable information to you as I possibly can. All right, without further ado, let's jump into this incredible knowledge shared with us today by the great Button Masher. So I did an arrangement of Meta Knight's Revenge. Um... And even before that, I had this arrangement already written out for Big Band, but I decided to take that arrangement, condense it down to like just organ. So I was playing the whole thing on organ. A bunch of people got really excited about it and they showed it to Charlie Rosen, the leader of the 8th Big Band. And Charlie was super juiced on it. So he contacted me and asked um, if I'd be interested in recording that with his big band and his orchestra like having him basically expand it for big band and orchestra and uh i was i was thrilled you know i mean this is a a really serious group and they they were putting out amazing content and music and uh i was i was thrilled to be invited to be a part of that so okay so that, yeah then then we get to the we're, we're sitting in the room uh, and they're, you know, they're going through the categories, naming the nominees, naming the winners, and they get to our category, and they announce all the nominees, but I noticed that we were the only nominees that got an applause after they said our name, and I had a, a feeling right then and there, I was like, whoa, we could actually win, and then, and then, wow. there it was, we, they, they called us up, and I, I couldn't believe it. I absolutely could not believe it. It was, it's just such a, an amazing honor. I never expected this project to lead to something like that. It was the last thing I ever expected from my work. And, uh, and yeah, you know, I'm, and, and, and after that, a lot of people asked me advice, like on how to win and like what I did to win. And the thing that I would say to everybody is, I didn't do anything to win. I actually probably doubted us the most out of everybody, but like, but I, the, the thing that I would say is just focus on making great, doing great work. And don't, don't do, don't do the work for awards, like in the hopes that you're gonna win an award, like, you just have to fully commit yourself to this work and believe in what you're doing and things will work out. It might result in you winning a Grammy and it might, it might just, res I mean, more importantly, you should just be trying to get fulfillment out of this and like find a deeper truth for yourself and enjoy, you know, enjoy the process and enjoy the work, you know? Most of the people who I listen to, like most of my absolute favorite musicians in the chiptune community and even in the jazz community are not the most visible people, are not the people with the biggest social media platforms or the, or the you know, you, you have to be, I, 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 and I actually wish people were more open to, um, uh, look, looking for music and looking for musicians and looking for art outside of social media and outside of what's being recommended to you necessarily on Spotify because there's a lot of great art out there that is not necessarily going to be like in your face like getting thousands of likes on Instagram or whatever um, and yeah yeah, that's but uh, it, but it was certainly it was a great honor, and I'm deeply grateful to Charlie 
for including me on the project. And of all the pieces he could have submitted for that category, he has dozens and dozens of arrangements. The fact that he chose the one that I worked on with him was just uh, an amazing honor. Okay, so... Um, so chiptune is uh, the art of making music with sound chips that were used in old gaming consoles and really trying to discover what the full potential of those sound chips is. Everyone in this community writes for different sound chips. They, they find ones that they prefer. So here is an example of um, an original tune that I wrote for the original NES, uh, the Nintendo Entertainment System, uh, using a software called Famitracker, which um, a tracker is also a really big part of this process because uh, the tracker pretty much provides you with exactly what you need to make hardware accurate uh, chiptune music. Mm. Um, it's a vertical, it's basically like a DAW, but instead of a piano roll, you have a vertical scrolling set of data. Um, it has your notes, your volumes, your effects, and writing this way um, is actually valuable not just for chiptune, but also for giving you a different perspective on writing. Like changing your workflow can really change how you think about music. So don't necessarily just look at this as a chiptune specific thing, because there are people who use modern trackers, which have all the same capabilities of a DAW like Ableton, but they are formatted in this vertical scrolling way. So I'm gonna pull up, um, this is an original composition I wrote called uh, Beat Fighter. What's going on in the background, that's the tracker. So take a look. So I'll stop it there um, and talk a little bit about this. So the NES, you have two pulse channels, meaning two channels that can create square waves. And there are certain effects that you can do with these square waves. And uh, how you, like, you know, that two pulse channels means only one node at a time can come out of each channel. So if you want to imply harmony, like really dense, complex harmony, you have to do it really creatively. That's one thing that uh, this format really challenges you to do. You can't just write whatever chord you want. You have to either arpeggiate or use effects or do find, find some kind of workaround. And you're, you're able to see it in this one example. It's very dense harmony. This isn't just like major chords and minor chords. This is like, these are really uh, densely packed chords, but the way that I'm implying them most of the time is through arpeggiation. So uh, that's one of the real advantages to a tracker. It really challenges the way that you think. But also, uh, you can export your music in a format that would work on a Nintendo cartridge with this software. So that's, that's an example of NES music. Could we talk a little bit about your method of reharmonization. So when you sit yeah, down, sure. let's say you just have the melody. What yeah. what are you thinking first? Um so this is actually a really good example because I heard this melody. It's a really simple melody. So we take a look at this uh this is the first thing that I reharmed. So just the basics. <laughs> Thank you. 
So some people, some people might hear that and think like, oh, it's not necessary to reharm the intro. Like, there's no reason. But I heard like a really unique opportunity here for a reharmonization. So the first thing I did was um, come up with a rhythm that I wanted to use as the basis for my uh, reharm. So let's listen to the the under. <laughs> So like the kick drum is really highlighting where I want the chords to come in basically. So like... So and then uh and then what I did was I picked uh I took those moments where the kick drum was playing and lined up chords that would work with the melody. So uh let me make sure I got all the right ones. Let's see. Okay, almost, almost. And then, and this is actually my favorite part of doing reharms, making a melodic bass line that fits all of the changes that I've just written. And that's like a little interlude that I added. That's that's also all a button masher original. And then you put it all together. So I think a really important takeaway from this is that sometimes rhythm can be the basis of your reharm rather than just chords or like a melody. Like I really, I, I feel like I derived a lot of this reharm from establishing this groove first, like figuring out where I wanted the chords to play. And then, and then that affected which notes are getting reharmed, you know, like which, note, which notes am I harmonizing with these new chords based on this rhythmic ostinato that I've written. And then, that later in the piece serves as the basis for a solo section. I bring those chords back. like a, another transition type thing but but uh, when you reharm something i think it's important you can reuse that material in new ways and you can use it to like broaden out your arrangement you know so yeah. i hope that's descriptive enough i know i didn't go into like each chord of the reharm but like the general idea is you have a melody and then instead of starting with the chords that you're gonna like change under the melody starting with a rhythm and then that will dictate which notes of the melody are going to be reharmed you know and then yeah. and that leads to all kinds of different results you know i think the part that just kind of blew my mind a little bit um especially because i i i actually feel a little bit of what you described earlier and talking about using family trackers i feel a little bit maybe stale at times right with my mm -hmm. reharmonization Mm. Um, despite many different kind of methods I use and interestingly I think that my bass line and chords as a you know just as like a person who's always sitting down at the acoustic piano to start off my bass line and chords are always kind of glued together it's such an interesting concept to me you start with the rhythm then you create kind of like the rootless chords and then even after that only then do you create the bass line that plays off the rhythm and the chords really interesting it's like it's almost like backwards from what i normally do and i'm pretty much 100 percent sure that the next several things i write i'm just going to sit down and think of it this way instead so on your twitch stream i actually learned about this when you were talking about the family tracker you pointed out that 
there were certain like effects that were so much easier to do yeah. on the family tracker. Um, so you know, yeah. you mentioned, of course, you've mentioned automation, right? How automation yeah, is so much yeah. easier. But I think maybe a visual demonstration of just like why that sure. is. Sure, this is an arrangement I did of Samuel Barber's, uh, the fourth movement of Samuel Barber's piano sonata, the fugue. Um, I, I thought it would be a really interesting challenge to see how could I arrange this fugue in such a limited format when they're like, this fugue has chords that are like 10 note chords, like massive chords. How could I pull this off? So that's that's what I did with here. So All right, so already right here. Um if you're able to see my mouse, um I mean even if not, if you, pulse channel 2, there's a thing or there's a column that says pulse channel 2. And then um, on the leftmost column, you have your notes. So where you see C3, C sharp 3, and the, the number next to the notes is the octave number. So C3, C sharp 3, and then this, this number is your instrument number. So all of these numbers up here, all of these like words up here, this thing that says tick, hiss, crash, crystal, hit, lock, these are all presets that I've created. Um, and that's another way to, to get effects. But right here, I'm using preset number five for pretty much all of these notes. So that gives you really granular control over how every single note sounds. You can change the preset very, very quickly for uh, every single note. And then right here is our effects column. And that's really what I'm talking about when I'm talking about automation. Do you have any other questions, Noah, about yeah, that? Yeah, sure. I mean, maybe I was just going to try to summarize. So in other words, we have these vertical columns. And in each vertical mm -hmm. common, your column, you're looking essentially at a different channel that the sound chip can produce, basically. You're looking at like one right. of its oscillators or, or noise generators. And um, within that, you can basically write little bits of code that allow you to essentially tell it what to do. Um, and because yeah. of that, you could conceivably, quite literally, write a different bit of code for every note so that it's like preset yeah. five, seven, 10, nine. And so you yeah, can just yeah. like super quickly and easily create like an entire line that's like 20 different presets, basically. Yes, exactly. That's so, so cool. So, yeah, and I mean, and and, you know, tying this back to like jazz piano and jazz composition, this will take those skills that you've developed and challenge you to use them in a very, very different way that you've never thought possible. I mean, or like never conceived of before, because this isn't just you sitting down at a piano and plunking out chords. You have to be really creative with how you arrange and write in this program if you want it to be compelling and effective and not sound dry and uh, boring. So, yeah. When you are using a tracker, you know, we're, we're super used to zooming in horizontally in Logic, yeah. Pro Tools, Ableton to see our beat grid. So mm -hmm. when we're using a tracker and it's moving vertically, what kind of a time grid are we looking at? And yeah, that's a very good that? question. So there's, there's two different things that you sp set. There's the speed and the tempo. Those are two separate things. So the speed is, ba is ba basically determines the value of the ticks on the grid. And it's a difficult thing to get used to. Like, people have a set speed that they like to use, that they like to work with for their workflow. So I use speed two, and that means four t or four ticks is a sixteenth note, basically. So I've memorized. I've I've kind of gotten used to working on a grid where like, and in this case, I want to do swung sixteenths. So if you take a look uh, at this C at the top of the screen on FM channel five, and then the C sharp, it's one, two, three, four, five ticks. But to make it swing, you have to do like five ticks for this one, four ticks, and then five ticks. So it's like, it, it's, it's really difficult to get used to. I'm not gonna like try to pretend it's easy, but 
when when you do get it used to it, it's really fun. But you also like I'm one of the few people who works on Speed Two. Speed Two is crazy, but I think I feel like it opens you up to more rhythmic possibilities. It gives you uh, more space between sixteenth notes to have like really crazy arpeggios and runs and stuff. So, and t to answer your question more clearly, um, like to figure out the rhythmic grid, you have to just kind of find the speed that works best for you and test things and then when you find something that works you just do it a lot and you get used to it that's that's really all i can say about that totally that makes that makes total sense and yeah. I, I actually see why you would work at speed too knowing that because it gives you so much rhythmic control as you said um, yes that leads me into another question and um, certainly so in terms of the composition process when you're working with a tracker mm, mm. is your process to figure out your arrangement first or some semblance of it and be able to play it at the piano or organ instrument of choice or is it to actually program things into the tracker to this kind of really unpredictable well not unpredictable you know you're 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 programming it literally but um, use the tracker to create something really complex and then translate it to the piano so you can perform it and play it in your videos, etc. Right. Yeah. Um, it's... I I work with the piano a lot. I'm not going to deny that. Um, it's something I'm trying to do less because, again, like, I think it's really good to challenge yourself and your, per, you know, your preconceived notions of things and... Uh, and and how how you like i think it's always good to like when you're working on something to think what do i normally do when i start working on something and how can i do do it differently um but i won't deny it. i definitely use the piano a lot there are like in i think in that case i started with a chord progression like i wrote a chord progression and then um like at the piano i wrote a chord progression and then i started to work in the tracker it is pretty difficult to start just straight up from the tracker but i i am trying to do that more uh with with what i'm writing because i think it could lead to more uh creative results absolutely and so starting at the piano then when you're yeah. working with a tracker is there a function that's like record i'm gonna play this in uh, uh, so it ha most trackers have MIDI support. I can't work with a tracker that doesn't have like MIDI keyboard support. You can't really like record in. You can you can you can hit the record enable button and click play and like type stuff in as it's scrolling down the screen, but it's not going to be accurate mm. to like what you're actually playing. But I do type every note in with a MIDI keyboard. Absolutely. Um, there are other ways to type the information in, but I, yeah, no, I, I definitely stick with the MIDI keyboard. That Absolutely. makes sense. So in other words, you'll, uh, you know, you're, you're on like a certain, um, tick. Is that what it would be called? Yeah. A certain tick. Yeah. And you'll play and you, you... like a D. Oh yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Then, and it then it automatically in. goes in and you can right, hear it right. play as you're going. Okay. That makes, so it's almost like entering into like Sibelius or Finale or exactly. something. Exactly. Like and okay. you can even set the step input um, so that when you, you can set it to like 16th notes, well like four ticks, so that uh, when you type, it'll type 16th notes like for you. So there's like, you just have to learn all these different ways to make this easier and more organic for you, like while you're while you're doing. I mean, you know, and when you get used to it, you just get hooked. Like I, I, I really love this way of writing. And but since I also learned how to write in a doll, I have that option as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of curious. Do these trackers ever come up as plugins in a DAW, or are they always no, standalone? No, not okay. really. I mean, there is a company that I use. Um, quite or that i use plugins from quite a lot called plogue that makes uh chiptune like chiptune plugins that will basically give you all of the same sounds and some people in your audience might be wondering well if i can just do that why would i even bother with a tracker the thing is um 
what 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 I've actually learned because I I started out doing that before I got into trackers I was trying to make chip tune just in the DAW, but uh, when I when I like as I, I mentioned Schnabubula earlier when I discovered his music I was like there is really something going on here that is completely absent in my music, and I really wanted to understand that better. And the thing that you will discover is the level of automation and the level of granular control that you have in a tracker really makes a huge difference in terms of the way that the music sounds. I was just going to throw out there that to me it's almost like, you know, like you can get a profit emulation from Arturia or you can buy a physical profit. And for some people the emulation is great and it gives you so much uh, creativity and inspires you that's all you need and then for other people sometimes having the actual hardware which does also arguably have you know its own very unique sound um, for some people I think having the actual hardware can just inspire you in a completely different way and sometimes Absolutely. you know it's it's this, I would imagine it's the same thing with the tracker you are putting constraints on yourself that might actually make you 10 times more creative and so it's it's worth at least experimenting with tools um even even if they sound complex like the tracker like even now i'm kind of like this seems really overwhelming but also i have that like curiosity bug i kind of want to try you know what i mean yeah, uh, and i think it, it's worth trying because you never know you might try it and then realize wow this is a really great way of of doing things for me yeah and, you know, forget the tracker. I think everyone should just be more open to uh, challenging themselves and challenging the way that they make music, particularly if you feel like you're in a rut and you keep writing the same thing over and over and over again. Sometimes the thing you need is a new workflow. So, like, that doesn't necessarily have to be a tracker. It could be a different DAW or... Uh, working with a different sound or giving yourself like a really specific set of constraints to work within so like that's that's definitely been one big broad takeaway for me from all of this if you had to give folks a starting point what would be in your opinion the best easiest way for someone who's used to you know composing at the piano or in a DAW to jump into chiptune what would be your like number one recommended way this is how you should try it out yeah i think um well here's how i did it and this got me where i wanted to be the quickest uh i i downloaded family tracker which is free and it won't take up any space on your computer you do need pc to do it so um, if you have a Mac, uh, I'm pretty sure all the new Macs come with boot camp. So just, um, I, I would, yeah, I would get FamiTracker. Find some way to get FamiTracker. And then this is how I learned it. And everyone told me, everyone in the community told me this is how you should learn it. Um, get a reference module. Like find somebody whose music you really like and just ask them, like, can I have a module? Like, can I get like this module for this song and uh also battle of the bits is an amazing resource with tons of reference modules that you can just download for free um open a blank window of fami tracker look at their module and literally practice just typing in the data on your module that you see on their module and if you do that for like ha even half a song you'll be able to write i'm i'm complete i swear by it like for me that's how i started that's how i got into it and i didn't even have to do it for an entire song to like pretty much figure everything out and get used to it so that that would be my advice if you if you really wanted to start doing this um it does it definitely does take a certain mindset you have to be like interested and open to doing this and like understand what the music is and like why we're doing this um but but you know maybe even before doing that just like go on battle of the bits and check out the music that people are posting on there i think 
that will uh, go a long way. Like I've, I, I never get bored on that website. I mean, there are just some of the cra- some of the craziest music I've ever heard on on Battle of Bits. It's, it's really, it's a very cool place, and uh, people really care about making great art on there. And it's not just chip tune. There's it's a lot of there's a lot of electronic music and there's a lot of variety and a lot of people just prefer trackers it's not even just for like nes stuff like a lot of people use this tracker called open mpt which stands for open mod plug tracker and it's it's a tracker that can take vsts so you can you know for a lot of people it's about the workflow so i i i wouldn't even necessarily stress like family tracker or or any of these things, I just, I just think, um, I, 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 I mean, well, I guess the question is related. I'm sorry, I'm kind of on a tangent. I no, know the question straight. is kind of related to chip tune, but like, um, you, you have to, fir- you, you do have to first be open to writing things in a new way, and this really is not the same as like switching from Ableton to Logic. This is a totally different way of viewing music. So you have to be open to that. That's 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 definitely the first thing. But check out guys like Schnabubla, check out Razorak, check out Chimer Ratio. If you like any of this stuff, uh, if it resonates with you and you think it's worth studying, that's that that's the starting point. And then, you know, download the software and do what I said. Take a reference module and copy the data that you see in one reference module into a blank module and you do that for long enough you'll you'll have the workflow down because you're what you're basically doing in that instance is going through data entry you're 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 practicing data entry and you're looking at somebody and you're look you're learning like oh what does this effect do i say i see he wrote 210 next to this note what does that do and when you take that when you can practice like hearing the note with that effect, hearing the note without that effect, and then you just start to learn the stuff, and it becomes, you know, it probably took me two weeks to learn Tracker, but I was really going hard with it. Like, I'm not, I wasn't just, like, doing it five minutes a day. Like, I was really committed to getting this sound and getting to this uh, style of writing. So that would be my advice, yeah. Awesome, thank you. And you also answered yeah. what my next question was going to be, which was just, like, who would you recommend people check out right off the bat? Um, yeah. Well, uh, Schnabubla, uh, Jake Kaufman, the guy who wrote the soundtrack to Shovel Knight, a lot of people don't know this, but the entire Shovel Knight soundtrack was written in Tracker and nothing else. Really? So that's, uh, you know, people are still using this stuff for games. There are still char- chiptune artists writing music for games. So um, Jake Kaufman... Uh, uh, Razorek, uh, Hannah Lee, she's another really killing chiptune artist. Oh, this guy, Dammy Fortune, uh, I just interviewed him on my Twitch show. Uh, he's unbelievable. Does does every sound chip, but he does, you know, great NES music. R.R. Teal, like I said earlier, Cosmic Gem, he's, oh my god, Cosmic, that's another guy. I can literally, I can rattle these names off. Oh, Peripanol, that's another one. She's from Brazil. Um, really incredible chiptune artist she does a lot of stuff with mml uh yeah i mean if you join my discord server you'll literally just meet all these people and they're posting music in there all the time so that's so awesome yeah yeah well cool jake thank you so much um, yeah thank it's you been for having such me. a it's pleasure. pleasure yeah everybody check out button master best place instagram right underscore button yeah, master i would agree the link in yeah. his uh in his profile has links to yep. everything. Um, so be sure to yep. check out Jake's stuff. Absolutely incredible if you couldn't already tell. Um, so much to learn there, so much to learn, even just from the rhythmic jazz reharmonization, harmony perspective and improvisation. Um, so yep. yeah, Jake, thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate thank it. Thank you, Noah, it's been such an honor. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Appreciate it so much, man. We'll yeah. definitely, we'll do it again soon. And um, yeah, man. Thank you so much.
Thanks. I'll see you soon, buddy. All right. Thank you so much for checking out this episode. Again, if you want to hear the whole thing, be sure to click the link in the description to check out Jazz Lab across other platforms. Thanks again to Jake for the incredible knowledge that he shared, and I hope you all enjoyed it. If you're new to the channel, consider clicking subscribe so you don't miss any more videos just like this one. And I also really appreciate you hitting that like button. Really, really helps out my videos. Thank you so much, and I will see you next time.